How do I even get myself in these situations? This is a cursed error message thrown up by Netscape Communicator 4.7, an early web browser, that would later become the basis of Firefox in the present day. It was released in 1999. This version of Netscape is running on top of SunOS 4.1.4 on an emulated Sun 4M Spark Station 5. In and of itself, that probably wouldn't be notable. However, Netscape on SunOS 4 came in two separate editions, one for sites using DNS and one for sites that use Sun's Network Information Service, or NIS. However, for the vast majority of those watching who were born in the 1990s or later and are less familiar with Unix system administration, you might be wondering what the big deal is. NIS, which was also known as Yellow Pages, or YP, was Sun's solution to managing a network. However, NIS was built in an era where the standardization of the internet was still an ongoing process. After all, the DNS protocol, which underpins the modern internet, came out the same year that NIS first released, 1985. To give you an idea of how early in the history of the internet we're talking, this is an era when network name resolution primarily involved updating the host's file on every computer in a given network through some amount of manual effort and shell scripting. With this understanding, a lot of NIS's quirks are more understandable since it was designed to manage mostly isolated networks in an era where direct access to the internet was both rare and exceedingly expensive. To demonstrate this, we're going to install SunOS 4, initialize a NIS cluster, and see just exactly how Sun Microsystems defined Unix directory services for the better part of two decades. With that said, this is your host and commander, and today we're going to use Netscape and NIS to surf the web. As always, if you enjoy this content, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on a monthly subscription on Patreon or a one-time contribution on Coffee. With that said, let's talk about SunOS. SunOS was Sun's original Unix system first released in 1982 and remained their primary product until the early 90s. Many of Sun's core technologies, such as NIS and NFS, would be developed on early versions of SunOS and the company as a whole were early adopters of both TCP IP and the then up and coming internet. What I am installing in the background is the final release of SunOS 4.1.4, released in 1994. This puts it at a weird point in Sun's chronology. Three years prior, Sun had announced a move to their second generation Unix operating system, Solaris. Solaris represented the replacement of the BSD-based Sun OS for a new system built around AT&T System 5. However, Unix solutions as a whole usually came with support periods measured in decades, and Sun's was no exception. While Solaris would be announced in 1991 and ship in 1992, Sun OS would remain supported by Sun until 2003. That's an impressive tenure for any piece of technology. However, you don't let an operating system go that long in public without getting a little long in the tooth. It's here where we get to the Netscape part of the story. I'm not actually sure how much of an introduction Netscape truly needs. If you're familiar with Firefox, then you've used a modern data center navigator. Enough said. As far as actually surfing the web, Netscape isn't very useful as a web browser anymore. Where it shines is as a graphical FTP browser, and for downloading files from a host system served by Python's built-in HTTP server. However, the first time I loaded up, I was greeted with the error message that formed the basis of this whole video. I also learned that if you load up the WIF DNS version, it tells you you might need to use the YP NIS version instead. So let's set up an NIS cluster and take a closer look. For SunOS specifically, NIS requires some specific configuration options to be done during setup. This includes using the server configuration and creating an export partition, which is needed for network clients to work properly. If you don't do this, setting up NIS clients will fail in various ways down the line. Assuming you did everything correctly, after the files copy, you'll be greeted with a login prompt. After logging in as root, I create a non-root user switch accounts, and jumped into open windows. Of all the vintage UIs I've used, I still think OpenLook, as well as the earlier SunView, are some of my favorites. Now comes the fun part, configuring NIS and creating the master database. 
This is done with the YP in command, which will ask a few basic questions and then initialize the var YP directory. NIS essentially works by turning copies of the system config files into special online databases known as maps. That means if I were to create a new user on Yaga's drill and then update the NIS map, that user will suddenly be able to log in at any machine on the network. Maps, however, have to be updated by hand with the makefile and var YP, which was a common source of problems back in the day. You might also notice that the end commander user's password hash is visible. This is one of the many reasons that Sun tried to replace NIS with NIS+. However, in true Unix tradition, the supposedly better solution failed to gain adoption and quickly vanished while the technically flawed but working solution has remained around even to the present day. Enterprise software truly hasn't changed much in four decades. Now that we've got a basic NIS server up and running, let's add another machine. If we're going to do real name resolution with NIS, we're going to need a real network. A machine can be registered in the ethers database and assigned a name. Said name must also be listed in the host file to provide forward and reverse network resolution. We then need to update NIS's ether and host maps. We're now ready to make some magic happen. By using the add client utility, we can set up what are known as export directories. If you're familiar with NFS, you might be able to guess what's about to happen. Now, let me add a second machine to my virtual network. This is a second instance of QMU, specifically configured to have the same MAC address that I just added to the ethers file. I am also running a real SparkStation 5 ROM, which is required for this step. Since the emulator's hard drive is empty, Sun's open boot begins to look for a network target. Since we've added the ethers entry, this new machine is able to get an IP address via reverse ARP and then starts up SunOS off the export directory on the NIS master. After a few moments, we're spit out right to a login prompt. Here's where NIS gets to shine. Despite this being a completely blank machine, I can log in as the end commander user and all my files are there. Typing mount shows that both my home folder and SunOS itself are being accessed via NFS from Yaga's drill, the NIS master box. This was the entire point of NIS and Sun's vision of the network. In a properly configured Sun network, a user could sign into any terminal and have all their information immediately available. The user experience was intended to be identical regardless if the user was on their own home workstation or accessing it remotely from halfway around the planet. Even now, I find it impressive on how it just all largely works. Although, in practice, there were some serious problems. Sun's vision in the 1980s was that the network was a natural extension of one's computer. By 1985, with the releases of Sun OS 2, NIS, and NFS, that vision was made reality. NIS would become the standard for directory management on Unix throughout the late 80s and 90s. However, this was beset with its own issues. What I'm showing here is a simple NIS setup with just the essentials. However, in a large enterprise installation, a fully instanced NIS setup with remote user home directories could have easily taken up rack space in multiple data centers across a wide area network involving dozens of machines. That's a lot of moving parts, and in my experience is that a few of those parts are more reliable than other parts. When NIS works, it works great, but it can go wrong and do so in a way that can deadlock the network. This was further exacerbated by design flaws in the NFS v2 protocol, which made this situation bad enough to warrant an entire chapter describing the problems in the Unix haters hand guide. Sun itself also tried to replace NIS with NIS plus, but failed. I don't know much about NIS plus yet, but it's pretty telling when I can't find anyone who can say anything good about NIS+. That said, we're here to test Netscape, and it was right here where the wheels fell off the wagon. While I can start X in a diskless configuration, running Netscape appears to be a bridge too far. The system crashes back to the command line every time I attempt it. This isn't really that surprising, as diskless clients struggle to run demanding apps, and Netscape could bring even a beefy system to its knees. Let's back up and actually install SunOS to the hard drive. While it's possible to do what's known as a dataless install, we'll simply select a standalone configuration and attach it to the NIS cluster. This is a nice simple setup that worked great until my NIS setup snapped in two not long after. 
I now fully understand why a large subset of the comments that I get can best be described as a trauma response whenever NIS comes up. I don't know how I did it or why it chose this moment to break, but at some point between the beginning of filming and now, I had managed to skew the domain name on my NIS cluster. I had installed it as NCCIS instead of NCNIS as I intended. This small mistake wrecked havoc as everything started timing out looking for a non-existent root server. Debugging NIS requires that you know how to enable logging, knowing that said logging exists, dealing with the incredibly terse sun error messages, and hoping you get an error message in the first place. It wasn't terribly hard once I realized my mistake, but this is getting close to Ooga Booga networking. It also doesn't help that at one point, the misconfiguration caused Yggdrasil to stop booting. I had to drop into single user mode to sort out this mess. While I did get this problem sorted, I wasn't quite over the hump. However, with the domain name properly set, the NIS client, Odin, now started all the way up to a login prompt. However, if I try to log in as N Commander, I get a warning. My home directory is missing. I could tell you that I did the sane and sensible thing and just made a new home folder on Odin. I could tell you that. So, anyway, let's talk about auto mount. Auto mount is a feature where remote file systems are automatically configured from NIS and loaded as needed. In this two computer network, my home folder is on Yggdrasil. What I want is it to be always available as slash home slash n commander, no matter where I am on the network. I can do this by moving my home folder on Yggdrasil to the export file system and then setting up the auto.master and auto.home files to say that home end commander is on Yggdrasil as export home end commander. After starting the auto mount daemon and logging in as the end commander user, we can see that home end commander is now a symbolic link to the export directory. It was created on the fly by auto mount since my data is local to the system. If I now switch to Odin and log in, we can see that the link now points to temp underscore mount. We can also see that the home folder was silently mounted in the background. So yeah, auto mount. Neat idea tempered only by my sneaking suspicion that many of the NIS horror stories that I have heard over the years sounds a whole lot like auto mount losing its mind. However, now that we climbed this mountain of networking, we are ready to launch Netscape. This is made especially easy since I already had it on my home folder on Yggdrasil. Mission accomplished. Or well, it will be. To actually, you know, see the point of this, we need to have a web server only accessible over NIS. So it's time to build Apache. Fortunately, there are binaries available for GCC 2.95. Building and configuring Apache only took a few minutes after that. A quick test in Firefox on the host system confirms that Apache is working and accessible via Yggdrasil's IP address. However, we're not here to play with IP addresses, we're here to do name resolution with obsolete technologies. At this point, resolve.conf is empty on Odin, so there's no DNS name server set up. Let me load up a copy of the DNS version of Netscape and try to resolve yggdrasil.ncnis. As expected, it doesn't work. However, if I load up the NIS version of Navigator instead, we can see that it loads the Apache landing page without a problem. A quick check with Wireshark reveals that the lookups were done by NIS in the background. However, this isn't quite the end of the story. I had gone into this thinking that these two versions of Netscape were a kludge around the fact that SunOS lacked name services switch or NSS. SunOS's successor, Solaris, provided a new config file nsswitch.conf, which allowed the behavior of the system resolver to be configured. This also propagated to Linux and was made a mainstay of the later System 5 Unixes, helping to prevent this sort of madness in the current year. However, as it turns out, I wasn't quite right. See, you don't need a way to configure name services lookup if you don't support name servers. What I haven't shown is that SunOS actually doesn't support DNS directly out of the box. Despite setting up resolve.conf in this example and being able to reach out to the outside internet, ping isn't able to resolve apple.com. NSLookup also errors out, but that's because it's trying to do an inverse query. 
Inverse queries are an optional part of the original DNS standard that absolutely no one, not even Bind, supports anymore. Sun actually shipped a patched version of Bind that re-adds inverse query support specifically for Sun OS. Needless to say, this DNS stack has quirks. In its default configuration, SunOS will only consult its host files or NIS for hostname lookup. Applications can directly link to libresolve if they want to do DNS lookups directly, but are otherwise out of luck. This is what the Netscape DNS binary does. It is linked to the resolver library, which allows it to do lookups without depending on NIS. For example, I can open nethack.org with the Netscape DNS binary. Now, remember that part where I said default configuration? While researching this and asking questions on Mastodon, I was linked to a copy of a Sunsoft support article. This article describes the steps necessary to reconfigure the system to enable DNS name resolution, and this is the type of process that puts the arcane in arcane wizardry. However, without NIS capability, the NIS version of Netscape will simply fail to resolve names altogether. The DNS version worked fine, however. As such, it's pretty easy to see given the general inflexibility of SunOS's name resolution that Netscape was forced to ship two different copies of its browser since no other solution would suffice. I do have one thing to add before we close though. There is a way to get the best of both worlds. The NIS server daemon, YPServe, can be configured to forward unknown requests to DNS. However, this option is not set by default. It also requires DNS capability on the machine running YPServe, which means either the C library needs to be repacked, or if you're lucky, you are running Solaris and have NSS. I suspect a fair number of NIS sites didn't have proper DNS accessibility, and thus the DNS enabled version of Netscape would have been essential for users on those networks. With that said, I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into one of the more important, but rather obscure bits of infrastructure that helped tie networks together in the early days of the internet. As always, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this content, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting this channel on a recurring basis on Patreon or a one-time donation on Coffee. Until next time, this is your host, N Commander, signing off and wishing you all a pleasant day.